I'm Chevy. Today, let's discuss alternate uses for tools. Hello friends, welcome to the shed. Today is Wednesday and I want to get back to Workshop Wednesday and talking about tools and stuff in the shop. And a while back, a viewer suggested um, alternate tool use or, or using a tool in a manner it was not intended to be used. And that that user was or that viewer was Jonathan Howe, and um, I've met him. So thanks, Jonathan, for the question and the idea. I've put it off for a month or so because I had a really hard time coming up with something to talk about. I, I believe in that video I was discussing using my drill press like a drum sander. I have drum sanding bits somewhere that you put in your drill press. And that was really all I could come up with for a while. And then today, or maybe it was last night, something was like, oh yeah, I remember when I used to do that thing and I thought, and then along that vein of thought, I had like two or three more ideas to talk about. So that's what we're going to talk about. Also, I would love to hear if you have any alternate uses for tools. Uh, put that in the comments below. So the thing is, one of the, I guess, advantages of being a professional mechanic is that I own most hand tools. Between that and my woodworking tools, I own almost all the right tools for the job. Let's say that. So it's hard for me to say I use a tool often like this because if I do that, then I'll just buy the tool that I need for that situation. If I'm doing it often enough, let's put it that way. But there's always those fringe cases where maybe there isn't the right tool for the job and you have to make something up on the fly. As a mechanic, you learn those things every day because most mechanics in the United States are paid on what's called a flat rate system. And that specifically means that you, you get paid by the job, not by the hour. So if a job pays two hours, you get paid for two hours, regardless of how long it takes you. If it takes you a half an hour, you still get paid for two hours. If it takes you four hours, you still get paid for two hours. So you learn a lot of tips and tricks and ways to do things that are unconventional to get it done faster. So one of the like extremely early tips you'll learn as a mechanic, almost everybody starts off just changing oil. And usually you only have like a small box of tools and you can't afford to buy cups to remove filters. You can't afford uh, strap wrenches or anything like that. So one of the very first tricks every mechanic learns is the screwdriver trick. This tool can be used to change your oil. And so what happens is a lot of common manufacturers these days, your four cylinder engine, let's pretend like this is your oil filter, sits here and then you have a belly pan that sits down here. And so it's really hard to get a cup wrench, which is essentially like a socket for a oil filter or one of those, there's a like a claw grabbing wrench. You can't really get underneath the oil filter. And if it's put on really tight because the last person didn't understand how to put an oil filter on or from the factory they, these machines spin them on, um, you can get a strap wrench in there, which is essentially our rubber band that goes around the thing, but they'll slip. So if you can't get this thing off, screwdriver and a hammer, and you beat the screwdriver through both sides of your oil filter, and now you have a lever. And it makes a mess, uh, uh, but as a mechanic, you really don't care. Usually we have these big oil change buckets that sit with these big tops. So you're standing under the car, you beat this thing through and oil just runs down on that, no big deal. But essentially, you're just gonna beat this screwdriver through your oil filter and it'll give you the leverage to get the filter off. That's like the number one trick that every car mechanic learns early on in their career. But outside of that, there's a few other little things. And I was looking, I feel, I feel strange because the one tool that I use constantly in a manner that it was not, well, maybe it was designed for, is my pocket screwdriver. And I decided to just turn the camera on and record anyway. So give me a second. Mm. 
my pocket screwdriver is like my favoriteest thing ever. And I, I just had it the other day. It is essentially a little tiny flathead screwdriver that goes in your pocket. Imagine that. And if you've ever seen like a machinist, they all have them. That tool is like my universal go-to tool. It usually has a small, like very small flat head on this end, a magnet on this end, and a pocket clip so it stays on your shirt. And I don't recall ever using my, my pocket screwdriver as a screwdriver. Maybe I have, but most of the time it's a little teeny tiny pry bar. You can use it to pop connectors on, you know, car wiring connectors. You can use it to pry uh, staples out of wood, all kinds of stuff. And then the magnet on the other end is so freaking useful. If you drop a, a nut or a bolt down inside of somebody's car, you use the magnet to pull it out. I also use it like a scribe for woodworking. Um, most people own a marking knife. I don't, I've never used one. I don't do fine woodworking, so I've never need to put a scribe line on a piece of wood. But I have used my pocket screwdriver as a scribe simply because getting a pencil or finding my pencil was out of reach. So I would take my pocket screwdriver and scratch my cut lines and it works just fine. So that is definitely one, but the big one, and right now my, if, if the garage is a disaster, so I couldn't get to what I wanted to show you, but you don't need to see it. The big one is zip ties and a soldering iron. Zip ties and a soldering iron basically combine together to make a plastic welder. And it doesn't work for all types of plastic, and I'm not going to pretend to know the different types of plastics or what plastic zip ties are made out of or any of that stuff. All I know is it works, and the fumes are really bad, so you don't want to breathe them. Essentially, if we used it a lot in our shop because me and another guy were off-roaders, and our if you ever see the off-road guys with those big plastic wheel well fender flares they crack a lot when you hit a tree or whatever and we would take zip ties literally and lay them across the crack like if this is the crack you'd lay your zip tie across and then heat it into the plastic with your soldering iron once that's done you could kind of go put the soldering iron on the crack and kind of rub it back and forth and bond the plastic back together and that works beautifully like it really worked it was remarkable how well it worked. Um, and so I have used my soldering iron and zip ties for plastic welding, I don't want to say hundreds of times, but at least dozens of times. I've used it quite a bit because when something breaks that is, especially something that's not cosmetic, if it's just a functional piece of plastic, plastic welding it back together that way often restores its functionality without fault. It just works. If it's, it's not going to be pretty. Trust me, it's not going to be pretty. If you can build up enough plastic, you could sand it and then primer it and hide it, but it's not going to be a pretty joint. But it is going to work. Um, Hold on. <laughs> Jamie just texted me. I don't know if you watched the video last week where she showed up right at the end of the video. She does it like very, very often. But she just texted me, said, are you recording? Because I'm not going to open a garage door. So um, that's really it. I mean, the outside of using any ratchet like a hammer, which we've all done, we've beat these things to death. I don't really have a whole lot of outside uses for my tools. If you do, or if you can think of any, please put that in the comments below. Thank you guys for stopping by. Thanks for being a part of this show. Thank you. I, I want to tell you every day that I love you and that it's amazing how much uh, I get out of the show and your feedback and all that stuff. It, because it's true. It's amazing to me. I've, I get so much out of this show and you guys provide me with so much motivation to continue making this show i can't even begin to repay you so thank you again for being here thank you for supporting me thank you for checking out my patreon um liking commenting subscribing and i'll see you tomorrow hey doc wait i want to ask you something 
Today's random fact comes from simplewikipedia.org. What is that? What is simple Wikipedia? Is that for like stupid people? When were chamber pots used? In the 19th century, water closets started to be more common than chamber pots, but chamber pots were still used until the mid 20th century. Today they are used in countries that have no indoor plumbing. In North America and the UK, potty refers to the toilets made especially for potty training. Yeah, I guess I never really thought of that. I guess a potty chair is technically a chamber pot. If you don't know what a chamber pot is, it's a bowl that you go in and then you empty it. And water closets, that's an interesting word uh, for a bathroom. Uh, in West Virginia, we had outhouses up until the mid 1900s. My mom used an outhouse when she was a kid. A bathroom outside, just a hole in the ground. I'm not, I'm not okay with that. <laughs>